lifelong learning is the next normal. Curiosity fuels critical thinking and resilience, adding agility, value and quality of life. In the past, schools prepared students for jobs. Later, individual fulfilment became a priority. Now, customised education is a reality. All students should be taught to thrive on change and ambiguity because many new jobs don't exist yet. How do we stimulate curiosity and put creativity back into learning? Education technology can personalise learning, increase student engagement and enable access for all. But digital transformation in education is slow and less diversified than other industries. How can we develop inclusive models of education to deliver at the scale, quality and speed required? Tomorrow's learning societies will partner with governments, businesses, schools, universities, entrepreneurs and investors, working together to ensure that lifelong learning is part of the fabric of our society and designed to deliver a better future for everyone. Welcome back, Annalise Kerr, Data Futurist for our special summit on education. A great good afternoon to everyone. So as we could see from the film, which is partly also based on many of the data points we collected, is that throughout the 20th century, education remained largely unchanged. Then came the pandemic and really catalyzed the world's largest collective shift in learning. At every level, education was disrupted overnight. By mid-April 2020, all schools nation nationwide in 191 countries were closed, impacting 90% of total enrolled students, almost 1.6 billion people globally. The time is now to look at and evaluate current models of learning, and we must equip people, young and old, with the right tools to thrive in a fast-changing world. There are a lot of great opportunities out there. Leaps in technology have the potential to make learning even more dynamic and inclusive, and that's good for humanity. And as a futurist, I'm passionate about curiosity and lifelong learning because they are critical to building resilience into the fabric of our society globally. And now, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Professor Tony Chang, President of CAUS and Board Member of the FII Institute. Welcome on board, Tony. Salam alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. As a FII Institute board member, I feel privileged to be speaking here. I have been an academic for well over four decades now, and a senior university administrator for about half that time. From this perspective, I can tell you that the business of running universities has changed in many ways, including the way that we take on challenges beyond our walls of unsustainable resource use, social inequity, and our changing climate. The reality is that universities are late to act. The Brundtland Report on Sustainable Development was published in 1987, and the first IPCC assessment report came out in 1991. Now we are exactly 30 years later. There is no doubt, looking back, that these seminal publications were urgent calls to action. And yet, the contents of these reports make it to university lecture notes long before they make it to university strategic documents. 
Today, it is customary for university leaders to register their institutional vision for sustainability. I was a signatory, for example, along with leaders of 57 global universities to a joint statement calling for accelerated sustainability actions. A sustainability vision is critical because it sets the true north for how our university will try to better the world around us. A sustainability vision must reflect realistic commitments and true intentions. Otherwise, in the words of Greta Thunberg, they are just blah, blah, blah. This, in essence, is what I really want to talk to you about today. Let us not say what we do not intend to do, and let us begin to practice what we preach. We, the world, are facing a perfect storm, a result of the convergent challenges posed by unsustainable resource use, social inequity, and our changing climate. The impacts are already upon us. Just turn on your computer and television and you will see. The need for tangible action cannot be any more urgent. Resource scarcity and climate calamities are exacting harm on nations and people in a manner that disproportionately burdens the disadvantaged. If there is a clear lesson to learn from the ongoing pandemic, it is that disasters exacerbate wealth inequality. We are indeed facing the greatest challenges not only of our generation, but indeed of all time. In the face of these challenges, we must act. The traditional role of university, especially research universities like Cal's, include discovery, technology, innovation, and education. But times have changed, and the scale of the challenges facing society requires universities of today to extend the boundary of our purview. My university, Kaust, was established on the bedrock of environmental stewardship, with environment, water, food, and energy as our founding pillars, and sustainability as a core value. We are committed to the sustainable use of water, food, and energy, and the protection and preservation of our unique coastal and arid setting along the shores of the Red Sea. This commitment undergirds our pursuit of learning, discovery, innovation, and opportunity. So, well, that's what we preach. So now let me tell you what we practice. Kaos is a leader in science and technology, and these are domains where we have the greatest potential for impact. Consequently, these are the focus as well as for our investments and action on sustainability. So take last year's T20 summit, which was hosted by Saudi Arabia, for example. So in my years as an academic, I am not aware of any university in the world that has played as extensive a role as Cows has played in the Saudi G20. The G20 is a venue where policies and action plans are promulgated, and it is not normally a place to find university professors. Yet, our university engaged a sizable fraction of our people and we contributed to, and in some cases, led the dialogue. The Ministry of Energy led the development and adoption of the circular carbon economy framework by the G20 countries. KAUST supported the ministry during the G20, and we are now a core partner in implementing Saudi Arabia's aspirations. KAUST also assisted the Ministry of Environment, Water and Agriculture as it led the creation of the G20 Coral Reef Research and Development Accelerator Platform in order to secure a future for coral reefs around the world. KAUST is now the global headquarter for this effort. KAUST is also a knowledge partner for both the FII and the Saudi Green Initiative. With FII, our scientists have developed technologies to grow agricultural produce with seawater. Our spin-off, the Red Sea Farm, has recently raised over $10 million of investment to deploy their technology in the kingdom and beyond. And I'm glad to say FII has invested also in the Red Sea Farm. Just a few years ago, I mean, just a few days ago, it was just this past weekend, I took part in the Saudi Green Initiative Forum. Cows is, a contribu is contributing through our efforts on coral reefs, mangrove systems, and restoring degraded and marginal lands at scale. For example, Kaos has partnered with NEOM, 
on the world's largest coral restoration effort around Shusa Island, off the coast of Neom. The mangrove system around Kaos itself has increased aerial coverage by 20% over the time of existence of our campus. And we designated about 150 hectares as conservation areas to enhance our efforts. Our Center for Desert Agriculture is also collaborating with MIWAS, National Center for Vegetation Cover and Combating Desertification, to enable a more deliberate selection of native plants to cultivate as part of the Saudi Green Initiative. Beyond our academics, we also practice what we preach in running our own campus. Kaos itself aspires to be a campus that's both smart and circular. We have taken it upon ourselves to use Kaos campus as a living laboratory and testbed for smart and sustainable technologies. As I speak, we are preparing to launch our smart home. This house was purpose-built at Kaos to deploy the products of our sustainability startup companies testing technologies ranging from solar power system, geothermal cooling, gray waters recycling, composting, greenhouse design, solar windows, and a wide variety of smart sensors. Our smart home is an exemplar of what is achievable if we put our mind to it. Beyond engaging in the development of circular carbon technologies, we are also pledging to be a community that will be a model for resource circularity as we have begun to design practices that will lead to zero waste, zero plastic, and zero carbon on campus. For example, we will build a solar farm within our campus to produce up to 30% of our electricity requirements. We are also fully recycling our water, which we use, reuse to irrigate our lawns and our water, our campus trees and vegetation. We have constructed composting facilities to process our compostable waste and we have banned single-use plastic from our community already. I can go on, but I hope I made the point that at Kaos, we do practice what we preach. Let me now cycle back to how I started these remarks. In my over four decades as an academic, multiple sustainability challenges have converged to put global societies at great risk. These challenges are of a scale of urgency and impact that universities can no longer afford to be just ivory towers amid these enormous challenges. At KAUST, our response is, again, to practice what we preach. This response is emboldened by the Kingdom Vision 2030 and the unparalleled partnership and support from the Kingdom's private and government sectors. Governments, business sectors and universities must go all hands on deck as we wake up to the reality that a planet where we can all live and thrive is a collective responsibility of all of society. We live in an interconnected world, and the way that we utilize resources, develop new technology, engage in commerce, educate our youth and children, govern societies, and indeed live our daily lives, all impact but one planet. My hope is that when we glance at an image of our blue marble, our Earth, our planet, we will always be reminded of the boundedness of our living planets. The finitude and the looming perils in the horizon should be our raison d'etre for why we must collectively act, and we must act today. Thank you very much. There. Welcome Tony back, Chan. Edna Trainer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry. Um, as I said, no surprise there. Call to action from Tony Chan, the president of KAUST. And indeed, how wonderful it is to see the great work that's going on at KAUST and the relevant work, the very, very important work, and also, I think, demonstrating the importance of academia and its role in terms of where we go from here. Absolutely essential. So always a joy to listen to Tony and to hear what's going on. And to any of you who have not had the pleasure to visit KAUST, believe me, it's... Uh,
something you should perhaps put on the, uh, the diary, the schedule, the next time, because it is quite a fascinating academic institution and research operation. So it's really, really well worth it. And have a look at some of the magnificent work that they are doing in terms of making academic academia really, really relevant to what's going on. We're now going to take a look, and just to set the scene here, we have a bit of a, a bumper education section coming up now. And we have a few discussions, and we also have a few really great speakers who will engage, inform, educate, and hopefully inspire you in terms of what needs to be done in education. And I think we heard from the very, very start of this forum right at the beginning at that boardroom. We heard it from some of the key players here that education is at the very heart of everything we need to do. So that I hope we're going to deliver to you in this session. But now we're going to be looking at how do we build educational systems in emerging economies and the importance of actually investing and building them right. So we're going to hear now for the president of Mohammed VI Polytechnic University in Morocco. So please give a very warm afternoon FII welcome to Hish Hisham Al Hapti. I'm going to hand it over to him. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Today, the world population under 20 years old is estimated to be about 2.6 billion. In other words, more than 31% of the population is still at an age where they need to get their primary education graduate from high school and get the higher education needed to land their dream job. A long and pretty costly way to go. Despite the global efforts deployed in order to improve education's accessibility and the quality, the schooling system dropout rates are still at staggering rates, especially in developing countries. In sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it is estimated that about 42% of the youth leave school at an early age. When we look today at the cost of education, the average annual costs of higher education in public universities can exceed $12,000, not including living costs, knowing that the prices in private universities are much higher than that. And reflecting on these numbers, it becomes obvious that building educational systems in emerging economies requires new approaches that go beyond adaptation of existing models and concepts. Dare, experiment, disrupt, these words could summarize the way forward. Dare, change requires an approach that can dare to challenge current apprehensions. Experiment, change should favor experimentation of disrupting models. Disrupt, Change requires disruption to big breakthrough using all that is digital innovation. The pandemic has reveal, revealed new realities. The COVID-19 crisis has shown us that an estimated number of 91% of students were out of school due to temporary closures of this. It happened in the midst of the school year and most educational institutions did not have much time to prepare their academic continuity plan. You think this is bad? In fact, such events push many educational institutions one step closer to the new model needed for emerging economies. Mohammed VI Polytechnic University's DNA is made of disruption, digital, and of focus on addressing emerging economies problems. Many of the initiatives we deployed in the last five years since our inauguration had their validation path accelerated due to COVID. Here are some of the key learnings we can contribute to as a part of the reflection on the new model. Point number one is the use of edtech can significantly increase the quality of education and make it much easier to reach potential learners beyond the boundary of the educational institution and very likely beyond the country's boundaries. We have an example within the university. It's called Prepa Digital is an example. In Morocco and like many French speaking countries, access to engineering schools requires enrolling in two to three years preparation program before taking an exam. In 2018, 
we started fully digitalizing this program. With COVID, we were able to offer free access to all Moroccan students enrolled in the two years program. Within a couple of weeks, we opened it to all French-speaking countries in Africa. Such program will be launched later this year for a monthly subscription that is less than a Netflix subscription. Can you imagine getting an associate degree for less than 200 US dollars with no need for extra living costs? Think about that. Point number two, a significant barrier to edtech is often lack of infrastructure and the cost of communications. The lack of infrastructure requires smart investment strategies. Investment strategies that will ensure that the emerging countries' population have the needed connectivity and infrastructure to benefit from the rise of edtech and to be able to create and contribute added value online. At UM6P, we have invested in national data center with the largest high-performance computing capabilities in Africa and one of the top 100 in the world. Our belief is that having access to resources that allow to host platforms, run complex simulations in near real time, or unleash the power of artificial intelligence will create new opportunities to speed up the development of many emerging economies. Point number three, the cost of communication is often another roadblock for edtech, especially that streaming videos does require important bandwidth that translate to high volumes of data consumption. Working around this problem brings us to the third important factor, being able to create and mobilize ecosystems. In Morocco, we were able to bring all telecom companies, the regulation body for telecommunications, the support of the Ministry of Education to agree to make all data traffic to the national education servers hosted in our data center free of charge. The volume of traffic and the level of engagement of students more than tripled after this agreement was announced. Point number four. In addition to the investment in infrastructure to develop the right educational system for emerging economies, one needs to invest as much or even more in humans. Developing new models needs adherence from both the learners and the teachers. Change is never easy, but can pay off if deployed correctly. Five years ago, we started Lycée d'Excellence, an excellence high school. This new model changed the way we selected the students with more inclusions for girls and economically deprived students. We explored new novel ways to encourage parents, especially those in the countryside, to send their, their students to this school. Parents' allowance, even giving them some, some money. For the last couple of years, Lycée d'Excellence entered the top five of class préparatoire in all French-speaking countries. It is ahead and among schools that have been there for 100 years. Last but not least is experimenting new ways of learning with school called 1337, which is a self-paced coding school without professors and without exams. UM6P was able to jump into the number one coding school in the country, and our biggest problem is the fact that our students are snatched by employers before they officially finish the program. Such program attracts people from different backgrounds, school dropouts, high school graduates, engineers, that all share the same passion for trying something new and giving a boost to their careers. I emphasize the fact that a lot of work is yet to be done, and these are few of initiatives we tried and has given fruit. We will keep trying and failing at, the at times, but succeeding at others. We will have less failures if we work together and share our experiences and expertise. Change could come through collaboration, and this is an open invitation to you all, education institutions, governmental and non-governmental organizations, companies and others to join efforts and see how we can leverage some of the working models to build for the future. It takes a genuine interest in addressing problems in the emerging economies, learning from experiences, looking at success stories, and building together. Thank you all.
And Hisham, thank you so much. That was Hisham Al-Hapti from the Mohammed VI Polytechnic University in Morocco. And again, you know, big thanks to him for laying out the, the challenges and indeed the opportunities as well. And really looking at what it's, what's needed in any emerging economy, but also, you know, addressing change head on. Because I do think when we look at the educational system, we look at how fast the world is changing. And sometimes I think we look back and think the educational system needs to catch up. So it's great to see some innovative ideas and again, all in pursuit of excellence and I think with a big focus that nobody will get left behind. Now also I just told you that uh, this is a bit of a bumper session in terms of looking at education. People don't all learn the same. Uh, there's lots of different ways that we learn and we have two sessions coming up in a moment. We're going to be looking at um, experimental education and we'll also be looking at how technology can work and indeed looking at a wider more holistic approach to education. But first I'd like to welcome on stage from uh, the University of San Diego in um, the School of Medicine. She's on the Board of Trustees and she's Professor and Co-Director for the Center of Excellence in Nano Medicine and Engineering. Ada Al Muheri Muteri is joining us and also Peggy Johnson joins her, the CEO of Magic Leap. In conversation, ladies, I leave you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Ada. <laughs> it's great to be here with you. Yeah. I think today it's, we're just going to continue our conversation that we've been having about... Um, augmented reality. <laughs> augmented reality and how we can make education yeah, better with it. Definitely. It's a tool for education. Yes. Yes. Um, and maybe let's start off with just you filling the audience in on some of the ways that you've used it, and then we can go on and imagine all the other ways that we can use it. Great. Well, um, so I'm the CEO of Magic Leap, and we make an augmented reality device, and it's actually a headset. And uh, you put the headset on, and it's different than virtual reality because you can still see your physical world with the headset on. But then we place digital content into that physical world and augment really what you see. It can change how you work, um, how you're trained, how you're educated. And so we're excited about, there's a number of use cases right now mm -hmm that we've been involved in, um, including in your field, uh, medicine, we're involved deeply well, in Just health. a correction, I am a chemist and a chemical engineer that veered into the field of pharmaceuticals and medicine. In case, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a physician. But very talented. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the opportunity to augment teaching. And so you're a professor at UCSD, we, you can actually take advantage of remote learning with this, and you can have um, a student uh, on campus at UCSD, and you can be here in the kingdom, and you can be talking about a medical device you might be working on, and we can digitally set that in front of you. The student in San Diego can see it as well, and you can both work on it, and you can collaborate, and you, you each see the same thing from your location. That's great. So bridging, you know, remote learning on experiential type of learning can now be remote. That's wonderful. And you recently had a really um, complex, advanced application of your technology at UC Davis for a very intricate uh, and advanced surgery. Right. So it, and it all happened during COVID um, because AR can, uh, really help these remote learning scenarios, and we sought those out during the pandemic. But the situation was there was a set of conjoined twins, they were babies, and we work with a partner <coughs> called Brain Lab, and they make 3D images of the brain, and it's very complex to make those, but they'll scan the brain through MRIs, and then they'll turn it into an actual 3D image of the brain. So they had done this with the twins. And their software runs on our platform. So there's about a 30-person medical team that surrounds the, um, the separation of uh, conjoined 
brains, and they trained during COVID on this operation. Uh, they not only, everybody could see the brain from all different directions, but they also planned the surgical pathways of where the incisions would go, and they choreographed the entire thing for months ahead of the operation using the devices. And um, they, they, the, uh, the operation was completed in October. It was successful. And it proved that this can be used as uh, a training tool. It can be used as a planning tool. And even an educational tool for the, the parents who you know, were concerned about what their children were going through. They were able to watch it step by step. So it really augments what we're currently doing in the field of medicine. It gets me very excited, actually, to think about using it in other areas of education that require, you know, laboratories, for example. I remember being a teaching assistant and all the equipment and the expense it takes. Could do you imagine using it, for example, to train scientists on experimenting, all those, you know, general chemistry and... Exactly. Or, or physics labs. Do exactly. you imagine that? In fact, you could bring in a scientist from another continent away to teach a physics lab. Perhaps there's a particular topic that the professor who's on campus isn't as skilled in, and they can call in a professor from another area of the world who can see what all of the students are seeing, what the local professor can see, and walk through a science lab. And so you really, in some ways, uh, democratizing education because you can bring in experts that may not be located on the campus and sort of, you know, get the benefit of this remote teaching from some of the best in the world. So it's a, there's a, a democratization factor that we're pretty excited about. Right, reaching different corners of the world right. that may not have um, access to labs uh, or uh, infrastructure. But not right. only that, I mean, I remember visiting New York University way back, and one thing that they didn't have is space to have these kinds of facilities to teach. So even, even in a metropolitan city like New York, it, I would imagine it'd be very useful. Yeah, because there's constraints uh, to most universities these days. They've built out to the limits of their real estate, and this is a way to extend their campuses. It's definitely right. something that that uh, universities are interested in. There's also a sustainability factor. You know, you could have flown that remote expert in, but now they can stay where they're at, and you know, you don't have the expense of the travel, um, you know, the carbon emissions that come flying, some, flying a professor in. So there's, there's quite a few benefits besides just the, you know, the core benefit of extending your training abilities. I understand. And this is purely for planning, say, in the surgery case. It's just for, it's a practice run so that when, when they do it, they know what they're doing, correct? Correct. But just the, to clarify. Yeah. The, our next device, uh, Magic Leap 2, which we are um, launching in early trials now, and then we'll launch for general availability next year. Um, that device is basically, uh, it's a... It's a step up from our first one. It's smaller, lighter, it's uh, easier to wear, and there's a larger field of view. And so we're really looking forward to extending what we're doing already in healthcare even beyond uh, to Magic Leap 2 and taking advantage of some of those features in that, in that uh, next-gen device. That's great. And, it, and it, in this case, we're talking about education, not only in the, in the classical sense, like higher education, but beyond, you know, um, and training for, I don't know, in every scenario, I would say, the military, I would assume, or do you yeah, do any of that? Those are some of the early uh, verticals, healthcare, public sector, manufacturing. And you think about a manufacturing scenario, you might have what we call frontline workers, somebody who works in a factory, and generally they don't have access to digital tools like you and I do. We have a PC on our desktop, many times a frontline worker doesn't have access to such a device. And if they have a question, they might have to go back to a shared PC. This device can enable them and empower them, really. For the first day on the job, they can walk out and 
they see the, fa the factory, they see the machinery they're working on, and they may have a video up in the corner of their field of view that walks them through how to maintain the piece of machinery. It's very empowering and, again, democratizing for frontline workers who don't typically have that kind of digital access. So these are, these are things that we foresee happening, and how much of it are you working towards? And give us a little bit of information about where is it actually being used or, or tested or beta tested so, in, in, that, in the frontline work and, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so we, we've focused on those three verticals, but clearly any area of enterprise um, that involves training we, w we can take advantage of these exact same tools. And we chose to focus just on enterprise because it was, it was really the right entry point for AR. The device itself um, is head-worn, and it might not be the, exactly the right device for a consumer to walk around in, but for enterprise, uh, the use cases are such that we can prove out a return on the investment. So we have enterprises adopting it because it saves them time, it saves them money, it increases their productivity. And then as those volumes go up, we'll see more integration of the componentry in augmented reality, and that will bring the size of the device down to something that looks maybe just like a pair of glasses that you and I would wear, and we'll have that ability to augment our physical world with digital content, just as we do today in the enterprise space. Yeah, I'm wondering what, what are the uh, bottlenecks, uh, if you will, in, in your vision and goal to, to get to that point, make, it a, a, make augmented reality a reality? You know, some of it is just educating people on augmented reality because they all, you almost have to experience it to understand how it can be applied to enterprise problems. So we've tended to work with companies that are more innovative, and actually we're working here in the kingdom because the, the companies now in the kingdom are very much leaning in on Vision 2030, and it's been so exciting to have that um, the passion for technology here. And so you, we really want to be paired up with companies and countries who want to lean in on this type of technology. We're still, it's an early technology, it's very cutting edge, and we find the best use cases come when we work together with those innovative companies and countries who want to see the power of augmented reality. But some of it is really just an education problem, if you will. They have to understand what it can do, how it can help them in their specific company. A, a saying comes to mind that um, it seems as though it's a solution awaiting a problem. I know we have shown that it works in certain problems, but you think it's, it's got a little bit of that? You know, we've been at this for several years. The company, it's, our company is about 10 years old, so we have a long history in augmented reality, and I would say there is an element of that. Um, you know, we had, we had initially focused on the consumer market, but I liken it a little bit to the mobile phone market. When mobile phones first came out, they were large, uh, they were somewhat expensive, and not everybody had one. And look what's happened today. Right. So with volume, the cost comes down, the size comes down. And we've seen that even in our first and second generation product. It's, uh, it's much lighter, it's, it's smaller, it's faster. It's, it's just a, it's another step toward where we end, we, we all end up at some point where all of us hopefully will be wearing augmented yeah. reality glasses. But also if I, if I go back to the analogy with phones, I, I think there was an inflection point with phones where I, I'm not an expert at this, I have to say. I, I know nothing, but, uh, you know, we're talking. This is informal. <laughs> but it was, the, um, it was the iPhone, I thought, it, because I remember having a BlackBerry, and it wasn't like having an iPhone. Yeah. It really changed everything. So it wasn't just that it was smaller or cheaper. In fact, I remember it being more expensive. It was so long ago now. Um, it was more useful, I think, when the iPhone first came Correct, out. because they had the apps that yeah. did more than just text yeah. and call. Um, is there an element of that also going on? It's yeah. not just a cost thing? It's, we have to show that we're solving problems for enterprise. And when we have companies saying, well, the implementation of this really took out cost in my training. So, for instance, 
if a typical training session at a company has you flying employees <clears> in, they sit in a conference room for three weeks, you're paying for the hotels, the flights, the, the expenses per day to train a group of people, think if you just now sent a device to all of them and trained them where they were at. That has a return on their investment and that takes cost out. So our job in the AR field is to prove what this technology can do. That's you know, incumbent upon us to do that. And that's what we are doing now today in healthcare, public sector, manufacturing, education. It seems then, I mean, the pandemic is a golden opportunity for it what is. you're doing. Yeah. Because, you know, for example, if you're a student and you need to jump into the lab and you're under lockdown, I would imagine that you could put on a pair of glasses and at least get some sort of training. And Yeah, we had a number of students uh, specifically University of Washington, they, there was a graduating or a, um, a grad class that was trying to continue their design work and they used to gather physically in a room and design some componentry. When the pandemic hit, they couldn't get together and they had been introduced to uh, augmented reality devices and they, they began to use our device to continue their class from their homes. And they each had the componentry in front of them, wherever they, whatever home they were sitting in, they all saw the same thing. When they annotated the device, you could, everybody saw the modification at one time. So it really is an extension of a, of a physical classroom. And I think as we go into this post-pandemic world, I think we're gonna continue with a lot of hybrid scenarios in work, in the classroom, where we're gonna be doing a little bit of both. So augmented reality technologies can really play a role in a post-pandemic world. Yes, there is an element, of course, of like building the models, right, that they're gonna use in that specific industry. Right. And it, it's an upfront, it, I would say, it, it actually give us a sense of how much time and effort it would require to start into a new, say, example, enterprise with a, in a new industry, how much time would it take for you to be able to help them build a model that is useful for them? Well, this and is And the cost, et cetera. Yeah. I, I have no idea. So um, the idea is to make that as short as possible, to make it as usable as possible, as quickly as possible. And this is where we get into this idea of the metaverse. And the metaverse is where you're basically uh, virtualizing your physical world. So you can take elements of your physical world and digitize them, and then bring them into, uh, into your physical world as right. needed. Yes. So there are several companies now who are working on it, such as the one I mentioned, Brain Lab, where they're digitizing images of the brain such that they're recreating a 3D model of the brain. Once you have it digitized, you can blow the brain up. It can, it can look as big as this room. You can walk inside of it. You can uh, see different elements of the brain Whatever data they have applicable right. to that object. First, they have to build the data, in. right? Correct. You have to yeah. pull the data together, right. digitize it. And, and, and that process is, at times, I mean, time consuming. That process is, is you know, days Tedious. and maybe weeks. Right. It's not, we're, we're not talking right. longer than that. And of course, it's getting shorter and shorter as more and more tools come onto the market that help with the digitization. And, for instance, Facebook's announcement, they'll really be um, working hard to build this metaverse that we can all tap into. Right. And um, it brings to mind, I remember when CALS first got started, they, um, they had, I think, something similar with the cave. So it's definitely exciting. And yep. we, I wish we had more time. We could talk forever about the possibilities. Well, thank you, Ada. It was a lot of fun. There's a yeah. lot more to come. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And ladies, I wish we had more time. It was such a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. And there you can see when we look at digitalization in education, like in every other segment, it is catching up, yes. And again, it catches up in different countries at different times. And I think ultimately that's what we all need to be really looking at where we can make sure that it can catch up and bring everybody together and make sure that nobody is left behind. Now, I'm going to hand over to Annalise. She's with us, and she will continue to give us her analysis of what is going on. It's always great to check in with her and see what's going on. So, Annalise, please.
how exciting. Don't you just all want to walk into that massive brain? Wow. Well, going back to sort of status quo and trying to look a little bit into 2030, for developing nations, the pandemic setback advances in education about 20 years. And yet, this disruption and new learning tools could bring unexpected opportunities to everyone. Already, adult education, corporate learning is undergoing a profound transformation. Educational tech or edtech presents opportunities to create quality, meaningful and inclusive learning for all. And we also see technologies such as XR, or extended reality, which is basically happening also here in the background, in case you wondered. Artificial intelligence and e-learning, all of those new technologies will play a major role in today's and tomorrow's education. When we look at investment, venture capital going into edtech last year alone was 32 times higher than just 10 years ago. And while the key investment opportunities are in, the, in educational tools, we must not forget to emphasize on quality content and empower the content creators, because technology and the innovation that it brings must have impact where it can amplify the work of educators. I mean, it's obviously very important to understand how we can go beyond the sort of reality as we know, and one day soon, of course, education will be in the metaverse. Now, some of the numbers here again, you've probably seen the numbers rolling over the little screen. Uh, education will be worth $7 trillion by 2025, and it will grow perhaps to in the region of $10 trillion in just 10 years. Global e-learning is expected to reach a market value of more than 660 billion by 2027. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a great opportunity for all of us to get together and rethink what learning is and what it can be in the future. Thank you. Annalise, thank you so much. And we will hear from Annalise just before we close off our session. We have our panel now, and I'm absolutely delighted to bring a very diverse panel with us. A wonderful panel that's going to join us now for a conversation for about 40 minutes, and we're really going to take a wider look at what's going on in education, what's happening right now, what needs to be done, and maybe what needs to be revisited. So I want to thank you all for coming and joining us. Very quickly, I'll introduce you. Um, futurologist, author, founder of Atelier and Associates, Jack Atelier joins us. Lovely to see you. Um, also from the CEO from Area 9, Ulrich Christensen is with us. And I'm absolutely delighted to, to join on this panel who the Vision of Peace founder. Um, absolutely, Cheryl as always. Cheryl Halpern, thank you so much for joining us. Jacques, if I may talk to you, and we've heard a lot about new technology and we've heard a lot about what we can do in education. Um, do you think it needs to be perhaps more holistic? And where do you see education fitting into what you would call the economy of life? Well, the, the pandemics has demonstrated, as it has been said uh, uh, all along these days, that there is a, a huge lack in a lot of sectors and too much on other sectors. A huge lack in the sectors which are strongly linked to life, of course, health. We lack a lot of things, education, digital, uh, good housing, good food, hygiene, etc., etc. And these are the sectors of economy of life, which unfortunately represent less than 40%, less than 50% of the GDP, while the other 50% are sectors which are not as good as the others. Therefore, there is a huge need to develop this economy of life globally, and in that, uh, education is a, is a very important uh, part. And possibly the foundation, we'll talk more about that in a little while. Ulrich, when you look at the educational needs, um, I think we learn from perhaps looking back, but we have to look at the educational needs today and keep them, you know, making sure that they're in place. But also we really have to look ahead to the future. And talk to me, I suppose, about blending the traditional education with what clearly is perhaps something different down the road. Thank you. 
I've spent the last 25 years trying to figure out what, where do we need modern technology and where do we need to not throw the baby out with the bathwater and find the balance. And it's became shockingly clear that in the future we need to learn a lot more than we did in the past. It's really tempting to think that AR and Google and other things will make it superfluous to learn anything. But unfortunately, the, the reality, after having looked at thousands of curricula, more or less for everything for people who can read, um, as above the age of first grade, it's really, really clear that unfortunately we probably need to learn more in the future. And we can't go straight to 21st century learning without traditional skills, and without traditional knowledge. It's the interaction between the two that has been fascinating to see how important that is for the future. And therefore, it's a really tempting thing to think that it's one or the other, but I think it's both. And again, we'll have a look more deeply in that. Um, Cheryl, talk to us a little bit, obviously, about visions of peace. This has an essential educational element, without a doubt, built in. And indeed, we've seen this initiative, and congratulations to you. I mean, it has shown positive results, in fact, around the world. But why is it so important that we look at visions of peace in that holistic situation, and also with education as a key? You know, youth are the vanguard for the future. And in today's world, they have real fears about what they have to address in order to mature and be responsible citizens within their family, within their school, within their community. And I was approached by Indonesian families who asked for assistance. How can our children learn to express their fears, express their concerns, and how do they then learn to be at peace, both with themselves and with their community? And I responded saying, we have to focus on universal values, the golden rule, the ethic of reciprocity. Do unto others as you want done to yourself, and conversely, do not do unto others what you do not want done to you. And that's what started the momentum within Indonesia for the visions of peace in 2017. And there's a lot more you want to discuss on that, but while you're talking about, I suppose, children finding peace, um, would you say then that maybe they're, they're not finding peace on their digital devices? You know, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> this could take a while. <laughs> Digital devices have added yet another dimension to what would be bullying in school. You now have cyberbullying. You would have harassment. You have it in school. You have it online. You have cyber hate. You have regular hate. It has become a much broader picture for children to address, and they are dealing with exploitation, they are dealing with violence, e-gaming, look at Battleground 2046 that's coming from Electronic Arts, blow them up, shoot them up. Aggressiveness needs to be addressed. Um, I see you, Ulrich, you know, totally agreeing on this, so please, 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 come in here. Yeah, so for one, I, I've built a technology for tens of millions of learners over the last years. And of course, we use technology for it, but it's a little bit like with, with paper. It's what you write on it that is important. It's not the paper itself that is dangerous. But I completely agree that it has, it has provided an a unfortunate, ripe situation to, to enforce some of the negative things in school and among young kids. I also think that it is an opportunity because um, on the other side, I don't think it's just, it is a technology or a mobile device versus nothing, but I, but I think it's a matter of what we do with it and how we guard, put some guardrails around it. Because it does give us the best opportunity to address one of the biggest findings we've found over the last two decades, which is that kids are so different in the way they learn. We have to be ready for some people learning 10 times faster than others with, with the risk that we're losing one third, which is exactly the number we're using in, in the US education system. Uh, and have been doing for tens of, tens of years. Um, so the, the challenge with this is that I, I think that it's important to nuance the discussion. Mm -hmm. Of course, the cyberbullying, like my kid, both of my girls, who are now adults or almost adults, have been uh, victims of it. And of course, this would never have happened without the devices. But on the other hand, they're also part of the solution. 
but I think it's really important to be able to tell the difference between A and B. Mm -hmm. Jacques, where do you see um, the challenges here? You've been studying this for quite a while in terms of the great research and what you've written about and all of that. But where right now, when you look at you know, education, where do you see the big challenge? Well, if you want to understand the future, you have to know the past. And you look at the past, you, look, you see that education has been through three phases. Uh, one, which began uh, 6,000 years ago and last till uh, the end of the 18th century, which is where people learn only the job of their father and mother. The same. You repeat. You are a lord, you, your children learn how to be a lord, you are a peasant, you have, etc. That's the long history of mankind, but always that. There was a drastic change at the entire century, first in Germany, uh, Netherlands, US, and then UK later on, which is that people can learn to do whatever they want uh, of existing jobs, which was a long process which is not far from being finished because we are still in the process of people doing exactly the same job with parents. Then, this global education, you can do whatever. The third change, which is just happening now, which is another huge leap, which is that the fact that now we have to teach jobs that do not exist. Up to the moment, we always teach existing jobs, jobs of a parent or jobs existing elsewhere in the society. Now we have to teach for jobs which do not exist and we may exist later. That means one, that we have to change radically what we teach. Second, that we have to teach all along the life. For instance, people say, that there are 350 million people in, in the universities in the world and that in 2040 it will be uh, something like 500 million. It's not true. Because uh, everybody will have to go through universities even when they are in their 40s or 50s, but a way or another, will it be real, will it be digital, whatever. Uh, education will be a long life uh, activities. It will be absolutely badly needed by the nations, because the nations which is not able to train all along life its citizens are going to die. Therefore, it's an absolute challenge. And this is the first totally different world we're in. We have people still in the third world, first world, which is learning how to do what their parents did. A lot in the second world, uh, hoping to do the best world, the best job available. And pioneers in learning to do things that do not yet exist. And if I can stay with you just for a moment on that, because I think we might have, many of us might have gone through school thinking that our, our teachers really could maybe know a little bit more. We weren't quite happy with what they were teaching and they were meant to know. But now you're saying we have to teach children jobs that don't even exist. So where are we going to find the teachers? I mean, is this a challenge right now? This is a fundamental challenge because um, because uh, to be teacher is not anymore a, 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 a dignified job. I very often say... Sadly, that, I mean... Yeah, it's, sadly. It's... I often say that one of the um, tragedy of our society is that if you want to make a job less costly, you begin by giving that to women. And the fact that education as well as health nurses has been given to women was a way to reduce the cost of education. Because there are equal salaries to men in education, but there is no more men. Therefore, the salary is bad. And therefore, it's not anymore an attracting job. Therefore, who wants with a PhD in mathematics to be a professor of mathematics? They want to be uh, working in uh, Silicon Valley or in Paris or whatever uh, in uh, digital companies. Therefore, there is a huge need to uh, increase the status and the remuneration of teachers, uh, which means that we have, by all means, to spend a larger share of the GDP into education and to understand that education is not a burden, but it's a growth factor. Uh, it's, not, it's not something that we should support because we cannot avoid to do it, but we should consider that education as well. Health is a key sector for growth. We have seen uh, that in the pandemics, that health is a sector for growth. And now ed techs, which are not only digital, but all technology which are linked to neurosciences, 
uh, and also to uh, ground services, some linked to what you are doing, are going to be a, a key factor of uh, GDP growth in the future. Do you see this as a major challenge at the moment, Ulrich? It's an enormous challenge because the, in the past, you, you went to school, you got your uh, human hard disk programmed, and you used that program for the rest of your life. The problem now is we need to change that model to something where we learn how to learn new programs. So it's, it's a, we need to move an abstraction layer up and learn how to learn. And we need to establish school to be able to shape those skills so that when you leave what traditionally was known as school, you're now beginning the journey to become the person that you will be for the rest of your life. And it's a very, very big and very fundamental change in the role of teachers, in the role of school, in the role of all the things that we're doing currently. The good news, in my opinion, is that teachers are a great way and, and schools could be the great circumstance to provide those environments to learn that and to get to that point. But we do need to, to begin to refactor what we currently do in order to accomplish that. And Cheryl, how do you think we can bring that uh, uh, sort of an overall appetite for, for learning and respect for learning? And, you know, even as Jacques said, the concept of a new lifelong learning. Because I do know, you know, there are many people who can't wait to get out of school and think that's it, done. We're not going back there studying. No, no, no. We did it and now we move on. That has to shift that attitude. Would you agree? I do agree. But I want to applaud the kingdom for making some truly radical reforms to the educational system here. Yesterday, I had the privilege of going to the cyber school. The very title of that, I think, is fascinating, the, the cyber. The cyber school. And with the cyber school, you have 24 channels for broadcasting, different curriculum based on age, needs, special needs, gifted, and it is a fascinating paradigm, but included in the curriculum development, there is educational and developmental psychology, and there is civics, civility, and ethics. They are teaching the golden rule. They are incorporating behavior what is appropriate in terms of encouraging respect and tolerance for one another. And they're also encouraging through research that they teach the young people how to look f and verify. So dealing with misinformation, misdirection, manipulation, they are teaching the students, they are teaching the teachers, and they even are teaching the parents. So to be effective monitors, you have to know what and how to monitor. And, and that, I think, is incredibly progressive to see. Very. You know, well done to them. It's great to hear that. So another one on my list, Kaust, <laughs> and now I have to go to the cyber school. So it's worth it here. Jacques, there was a great movement, I think, over the years, and there still is, to get you know, young people, and particularly young women, interested in STEM, um, the science, technology, and math, and focus it that way. But I'm beginning to see that emergence of STEAM, as people are saying, and putting the arts into that, and this concept of, you know, a sort of a, a, whole, a whole brain, right and left, to make sure that we can do that. Is that essential, would you say, now? Definitely it is. It's essential to, to be uh, holistic, global, and, um, and to be uh, curious. I mean, if I had to, to say one quality in life, uh, more than anything of IQ, which is uh, not serious criteria of the future, I would say curiosity. And curiosity is linked to uh, something which is in English is called grit. The grit is the most important, which we can say motivation. Uh, and curiosity is of course, linked to, to art, then curiosity can be, uh, you, you have it or you have not, but you can learn curiosity. It's why education is beginning by giving the feeling that curiosity is a wonderful way to, uh, to uh, enjoy, to get pleasure, to understand things. And it's why education begins by the family. I always will uh, wonder why there is no uh, 
and education on how to be parents. We learn a lot of things. We never learn how to be parents. We should learn how to be parents in order to trigger curiosity and grit in the children, and in particular, uh, uh, trigger curiosity for arts. Nothing will replace the fact that your father and mother uh, show, you, if, you, if you have a chance to have one, to show you a, a beauty of nature and to say, why don't you admire that? It's a work of art. If there's a chance that you go to a library, to go to a museum, if there is one uh, not far from your home, but at least to understand that nature is a work of art and understand art and beauty as part of education from years one or two, not waiting to be a, a, a teenager to go to, the, to understand what art is about. Cheryl, if I can bring you in here. When we look at, I think, the older system, and I know the system that I you know, underwent in, in Ireland and it's in many countries, at a very young age, you make your choice. So you, you, you lose so many people in either direction. And the engineers and the doctors and the mathematicians went one way. And yes, some of them might have played piano or they might have gone to art museums and that, but they were very focused. And then we had nothing to do with science and that we were the other side, so to speak. How important do you think that is? And you encouraged that actually the educational system is looking wider and that concept, I suppose, of, yes, curiosity, but a whole new brain, I suppose, a whole new mind, and to use both sides. Well, and I will bring this back to the visions of peace. We work with children from ages 5 to 18. And in order to get them to express their own anxiety, concerns, we'd say, Speak, draw, sing, whatever modality you choose. But after you've done that, use any art modality across the spectrum. So if you want to tell a story, if you want to write a poem, if you want to take your guitar and create a song, if you just want to draw, if you want to dance, express your vision of a peaceful tomorrow using the arts as you so choose. And what's more, we applaud whatever they choose. We create and enable them to be advocates within their home, within their school, within their community for peace and respect, and we celebrate with them at award ceremonies. So they walk away with thank yous for being who they are. And of course, to continue that throughout their lives. And hence, I guess, why we were all dancing to, to Gloria the other night. So maybe I'll be excused for that <laughs> one, you know. So to bring it into the conference arena as well, to bring that fun and all the artwork we're seeing here at this event too as well. So reminding us that it's, uh, we need to keep an expanded mind. Ulrich, on, on this very conversation too, the importance of making sure that there is a more holistic approach. And do you think it's happening in every country? Do you think people have woken up, educators have woken up, governments have woken up, and the political will to drive a new educational system? Is it alive and well, or does it need a big push? I'm afraid the answer is no, no, and no. The, the reality is that we talk a lot about it, and very little happens. Because the second we leave the room, we go back to standardized tests and looking at how you are doing in math and what were your last English paper like. And we need to find a way from the current horizon to the future. And I think it's a given that for humanity we need to look at multidimensional learning. And I, I, don't, I don't even think that adding an A to STEM is enough. Because it's not just arts, it's, it's citizenship, it's ethics, it's um, the ability to communicate with other people. 50, 60, I don't know how many million learners ago, and 25 years, when I started looking at human errors in medicine, lots of, lots of medical professionals thought that it was, that it was a, a nice to have, to learn how to communicate, to learn how to be part of a team. What, what human errors and human factors meant, why? We were perfect, we thought. And then we realized that 100,000 Americans die every year because of this, and then people woke up. And we have exactly the same problem in education, that it is, unfortunately, we cannot allow this specialization in the future, but it's also one of the things that allows us to be special as humans, because we will be made superfluent if we try to be a better math book 
than, than Google, or if we try to have more uh, information than you can find there. That's not where we're going to compete. We're going to compete as humans by integrating lots of different aspects. Creativity rarely comes from, from one aspect. Actually, the biggest inventions, typically you find two, three, or four concurrent breakthroughs, often from completely different domains. So I couldn't be more in agreement, but I think that I've spent the last 15 years saying, how do we solve both of them at the same time? How do we both live up to the old standards of actually getting enough, enough knowledge, which is what all parents are afraid of, and all schools are afraid of, and are being measured on, while leaving enough room that we can get to all the modern dimensions of learning. Now, Jacques, at the end of our school, you know, our official school life, so to speak, and then our continual learning, we all need jobs for the most part, and people want jobs of sorts. Everybody has to, most people have to make a living. Um, but how is this going to impact you know, the labor market. Right now, I think people are having a great difficulty, you know, holding on to young talent. They don't know what to do. We're in this transition period. They were used to people coming in to take a job and expecting them to stay there for at least a minimum of five years and maybe work their way up. Now it's more like five months, and if they don't get a promotion, they're out the door sometimes. So how do we keep everybody happy, or is that possible? Well, uh, people are not going to stay one day if they have no meaning a sense. A uh, in French we say, and it's also used in other languages, a raison d'être. If you want people to stay in a company, you have to give them a raison d'être, uh, which is beyond salary, which is uh, something to be proud of with their family, something where they can explain that they are not here only to make uh, their living, but to make the living of Earth, of the, uh, uh, the country, of, uh, of the world, of the next generations. It's what I call uh, a positive, um, a positive society, which is a society working in the interest of next generations. If a company or if a government is not able to prove that what he's doing is good for next generation, they will have no one willing to work for them. At a moment where the talents are rare, and uh, that, by the way, that will lead to a huge increase in salaries in the future. Salaries are going to grow because of that. But salaries will not be enough. And the COVID has demonstrated that people can go away, work from home, create their own companies. And if we want to have people working, we need to find a way to... Not, it, it has not to be greenwashing. It has not to be ethical washing. It has to be real, sincere. And not a lot of companies are doing that really seriously. And the young are going to vote by, by, by walking. Uh, you are not uh, providing us with that, we quit. Ulrich, do you think um, you know, companies are ultimately going to, they're going to be forced to adapt because they're not going to have a workforce? <clears throat> Seven years ago, I, um, I sold part of our higher ed business to McGraw Hill. And we were wild in, in, in a fight over whether corporate education would ever have a chance for us to go after. And I thought, well, they, I think it's the biggest deal of the future. And that was a fundamental vision about, I think companies in the future will compete on talent. Today, seven, ten years ago, corporations bought libraries of how do you make pivot tables in Excel. That's not the important part of the future. The important part of the future is how do we become a place where people evolve, how, where we can select people who are interested in learning, in evolving, and then it's okay maybe they, they leave after six or 12 months because we have, as a company, become good at taking people from wherever they are and bringing them up to speed fast, teaching them what's important to do a job in our role, and it's okay that we contribute because think about this famous quote about, or this um, viral quote about, well, if you educate them and they will leave, you may lose them, but what will you do if you do not educate them and they will stay? Yes, and then that's, that's even worse. It's toxic to themselves, their teammates, and indeed to the company. Cheryl, um, sometimes I look at the market and a lot of people in the workplace do talk about, and we hear it in education sometimes, soft skills. I would say there's nothing soft about them. They're probably the most essential skills. What you talk about in terms of just that awareness and civics and good communication and, you know, kind of a concept of teamwork and bonding. And when do we, how do we get this elevated within the educational system? Well, there again, uh, we have to teach values. There is a behavioral aspect. Do you think aspect. we forgot about that? Do you think that's sort of, we you know, missed out I, over the years? To a large extent. I mean, when I went to school, and I'm not trying to date myself, but civics was part of the curriculum. We were taught how to behave. If 
you were seeing a parent come home from work tired and you ate dinner and there were dirty dishes in the sink. Don't sit and watch television. Get up and help. That was part and parcel of what we learned. It sounds so elementary. It is so simple. And yet that's, to a large extent, gone. gone. But it needs to be brought back because we need to be with one another in a family, in a community. We need to care. We need to be willing to show that we care. Go, you see an older person sitting on a park bench. Don't just walk by. Or don't push him off. Or don't push him off. Say hello, yeah. smile. Small things do mean a lot and they need to be remembered. Indeed, and I think, you know, is there a danger, um, Ulrich, that maybe we get to a point where we, we lose a lot of these values and then we just realize it and then we bring technology, we bring, you know, everything back together and we say, almost like what we're doing with the planet, we're going back to basics in many ways, is that where we need to go when it comes to education in one way, bringing all the technology, bringing everything we've learned, but sometimes because we've lost so much, we have to compensate and bring back more. Well, we can lose the plot if we use technology to solve yesterday's problems. Because it can be really efficient to get higher test scores, but what we really should be doing is using technology to solve tomorrow's problems, to secure that there is room for all these other things. Um, and, and technology can solve that, because what we did yesterday, we can do more efficiently, leaving the room for multidimensional learning. And the reason why it's so important, like, Anybody in here who watched soccer, who saw that there was a, uh, somebody who died on the soccer field during the European Championships? Mm -hmm. There are no standing operating procedure for national team players in soccer for how to handle that, right? There's no standing operating procedure for the coach how to handle that. And if you combine technical skills with identity or character traits, and I happened to write two weeks before that happened, I wrote an article together with that team coach about the importance of both the learning engineering and building a football school or a soccer school, but also the importance of identity. Two weeks later, that got pressure tested on worldwide television in front of billions of people when they actually reacted the right way. But, and that's the, that is the essence of what I think education is facing in the future. We need to learn how to deal with things we're not prepared for. We need to shape that skill set, including civil citizenship and identity and ethics and 21st century skills, but also the technical classic skills like knowledge and, and technical skills. But Jack, when you look at, I think, every generation, I think every parent has sort of scratched their head and said, oh, there's no hope for you. In my day, in my day, um, are you optimistic about, you have to be in, we all have to be optimistic about the future. No, 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 but, I would not say that then. I would move on uh, metaphor of soccer. Uh, if, you, if you look at, if you are a spectator, if you look at a match of soccer, you can be optimistic for the team you support or pessimistic for the team you support. But if you are a player on the ground, it's totally silly to be optimistic or pessimistic. You have to play. You have to win. And for that, you need to learn. You need to cooperate with your partners. You need to have a strategy. You need to have a stra know the strategy of people in front of you. Uh, that means that we don't have to be optimistic or pessimist. To be optimistic or pessimist is a, an attitude of spectator. You are, you are lost. At the moment you decide to, to have this question in mind, you have lost the match. The only way to, lo to win the match of life is not to be optimistic, not to be pessimistic, but to play, to act, to see what are, what are the problems and to find solutions. Solutions are grit, altruism, cooperation, techniques, and a strategy. And if you were to look at the educational system, and sadly we have to look at our, our timing um, in our educational system here at the moment, so Ulrich, as in we're wrapping up a little bit here, looking at, you know, that concept of, of the team, being able to strategize, being able to do that, you know, just wrap it up for us in terms of what do you think education and educators need to do now to make sure, you know, we're ready for the future. So I, I think I'll wrap it up with a threat and a plea. The threat being that we can really damage a lot of learners, both young kids and adults, if we use this opportunity to just drive a technology agenda mindlessly. 
the plea is that we drive it based on learning science and that we actually establish the same thing as in my old profession in medicine, that we actually make yardsticks. We figure out how do we, how do we measure whether it works? How do, we, how do we do things systematically, constantly improving things and are not just leaving it to the marketing drums of both startup companies and large companies, but to something where we hold ourselves and each other accountable for doing the things that we have reasons to believe will work. And coming back to my uh, old profession in medicine, where I gave an oath, which the first part of it is, first, do no harm. And we have a pretty big significant risk of doing harm here if we don't do it mindfully. Um, Jacques, again, just, you know, what do we need to do now that can actually make sure that we get, we go in the right direction? It depends, which is we, the family, the students, the country, the companies, the world as a whole. It's, it's the big holistic approach, huh? We need to, to consider that for each of us, as well as for companies, countries and the world, education is with health number one priority. Education all along the life. It's a matter of spending more time on it and developing grit and curiosity. It's a, it's a matter of survival. Nations in the past, which has not been able to develop education, are dead. Nations in the future that will not be able to develop the grit will not only disappear, but they will lose their, their talent. And, uh, and that will be the end of them. Therefore, we should now have in mind that education is with health a very important priority. We all speak about climate change. Fine. But how do you work on climate if you are not trained people? People with no education will not do anything for climate. Therefore, there is no climate change, positive climate change. There is no good education, not good health. Therefore, I very often wonder why we spend so much time talking on climate, which is clearly a huge problem, if we don't spend as much time on talking on education and health. We should have not only a Glasgow conference on climate, but a parallel conference on health and on education, which is the economy of life as a whole. Yes, because they all very, very clearly do go together. Cheryl, I'm going to leave you the last word on this too. And in terms of, you know, even your work here in the kingdom, which is, you know, so admirable, and we're going to be hearing more from you here. Um, so what do we need to be doing? Where do you see us going? I think that what the kingdom has done, going back to the cyber school, is really something that needs to be shared internationally. The notion of doing the live streaming, broadcasting, 24-7, is enabling parents to be able to sit with their children, to monitor, to listen, to learn with them, so it's not just a child engaging digitally by themselves. There is the interaction of the family, which I think is essential. And by doing that, and I'm going to bring it back to Indonesia, the motto of the country, going back to the 14th century, is Bineka Tungal Ika which means unity with respect for diversity. And that's what education really needs to embrace. You're talking about diverse ages, populations, ethnicities, dialects, the parental factors. We are diverse and we need to learn how to respect each other in order to engage with unity. And what a lovely note to close it off on. Thank you so much, my wonderful panel, very inspiring for us all, Jacques, Ulrich, and Cheryl. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. Thank you. And again, I liked that, unity with respect for diversity. And if any of you have ever had the opportunity to be at a, an event run by MISC, you will know that this is an institution here in the kingdom that absolutely embraces unity with diversity and is a very outward looking institution. I'm absolutely delighted now to be joined by the CEO of the MISC Foundation 
and he's going to take a look at investing in youth. And I know so many of you are here today and welcome, and we're so happy that you are here today. So a very warm welcome now for Dr. Badr al Badr. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored and glad to be in front of you at the closing of this fabulous conference on investing in humanity, a topic that is very dear to my heart and where I work. Allow me to take you in a journey in time a number of decades ago. In this small coastal town on the edge of Saudi Arabia, there was a little boy who, at the tender age of four, started to herd sheep for his family just to put food on the table. As he was growing up, the calm of this small town between the sand dunes was disrupted by huge machinery and foreign people coming in, drilling holes in the ground, making big noises. This company eventually started to hire people, the men of his village. They started hiring the children as well. He eventually joined the company as an office boy, found an opportunity for education there, went to school after work with this company. Showing his shrewdness and brilliance, the company gave him further opportunities by sending him on scholarships, first to Lebanon, and then to the US. Coming back with an engineering degree, he started working for the company, growing through the ranks, benefiting from any, all the opportunities this company is offering him. Eventually, reaching all the way to the top, becoming the first national CEO of this company. He did not stop there. He was later promoted to become the minister responsible for the whole sector and one of the global shapers of the geopolitical economy during his time. I think that last piece there gave us his name, and you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the no other than Ali and Naimi, who was the oil minister of Saudi Arabia till 2016. <laughs> Recalling the story, I could not help but ask myself a few questions. First, what if this company did not come to, the village, to Ali's village? What if they didn't see any opportunity, they did not give him a chance to join school there? What if they didn't give him leadership opportunities? What if they didn't believe in him? Let me further ask, ladies and gentlemen, what if Ali was in a different town, as there are many Alis in different other towns of Saudi Arabia who did not have that chance? Allow me to further ask, how many Alis are there today, all over the kingdom and all over the world, waiting for somebody to believe in them, to empower them, and to make them the leaders of the future? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the mission of the MISC Foundation, a foundation established by His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince, since 2011, with a vision to produce the next generation of Saudi leaders. Our mission is to create a pipeline of the leaders of the future through local and international partnerships. And we do it through various means and institutions. For example, we have a K-12 school that focuses, that has an innovative model of education that focuses on individuality and exposing the leadership capabilities of the young, MISC schools. We have many mass programs that address common challenges that Saudi youth have. 
for example, career selection, career advice, whether at the last year of high school or all the way through college. We have college prep programs that identify the elite Saudi students and help them gain acceptance in the best universities in the world. We also have fellowship programs that bring together the young leaders of all the universities in a community of leadership that allow them to learn from one another and help address the challenges that Saudi Arabia has today. The top of the chain in our programs is the 2030 Leadership Program. That's an inspirational new program that focuses on existing leadership that are ready for their next move to become the leaders of the next decade of Saudi Arabia. As we come to the close of this astonishing and outstanding conference, hearing all these great speakers and being yourselves inspirational leaders and achievers, whether those here with us today in this room, I see many young faces and some older faces like me, or those listening online. All of you are success, each and, all, each and every one of you is a success story. I would like to go back and remember what was a pivotal success factor that helped you reach where you are. Who was there to hold your hand to take you to the next step in your career? And what system was there to help you advance? Remembering that, I would like you all, all of us, to come together to provide that support and system to all the young leaders here to create the next Ali's and Alias of the future. Thank you very much. And Dr. Badr al Badr, thank you so much um, for that very inspiring and engaging um, address there. And indeed, uh, it brings back memories myself having met uh, His Excellency Ali Naimi so often um, at my time at OPEC and joining that. So I know he would be very proud to actually hear him looking at today. So much going on here, so much to do. I'm so encouraged that we started this conference talking about education. The leaders of the world's finance institutions actually said at the opening board that education was the very start, the very foundation, the very basics. And I think we've just explored so many things that we can do, so many things we have to do, because we're not there yet. And I think there's, we're almost at that transition period whereby education is, has to be the next big push to make sure we get there. We're not finished yet. We still have Richard Atias. I know he is nearby. And it's so great to see everybody here. This wraps up our focus on education. But we'll hear a few words from Richard and his team. So thank you all so much.